Advertising has us chasing cars and clothes. Working jobs we hate, so we can buy shit we don't need. Welcome everyone, this is Igor and I got Ryan with me here and we're here for the ninth episode of Project Uproar. Welcome. Yeah, today we're going to be doing our second book club. Um, the first one, if you remember, we did Stephen Pressfield's um, the, War of Art. the War of Art. This episode we're going to be looking at Seneca, who is uh, considered by many a Stoic philosopher his work on the shortness of life. Um, yeah, I think he's even considered by himself a Stoic philosopher. Yes. yes. Um, and I remember what's interesting is I remember the first time I was introduced to Stoicism was back in second year university, I think. I thought you were going to say second grade. Okay. Yeah, second grade. They were teaching us Stoicism. <laughs> Rides ahead of the game. People. Yeah, I think yeah. it was second year university where uh, I was taking a class on Shakespeare and we were reading a Shakespearean play, and it might have been Titus Andronicus, perhaps. But anyways, there was a certain character in the play that exhibited, uh, quote-unquote, like, stoic um, tendencies or characteristics. Tendencies. Characteristics, I guess. And uh, we got into this long discussion on stoicism. And That's awesome. I wish I was in that class. Yeah, but uh, it, was, it was interesting because I just... I had heard of the word before and I had just thought of it as someone who was kind of like emotionless Less kind of thing. Yeah, like like shows no emotion kind of you can't see them being happy or something. Kind yes. of stone faced. Yes. Kind of so, like that Spartan manly way of not reacting to anything. Yes. If you like, you know, you see a cartoon and there's a character who gets punched in the face, they just have the same expression that's that was my caricature of what i yes. thought stoicism was before taking this class and that's great i'm really glad you mentioned like what you thought it was like before we actually get into what it is because it's not that even in the book seneca says it's better to be one who laughs than one who grieves to laugh at life than to be sad about life yeah for sure um so i mean right off the bat um this is a translation, but I did notice it was a very accessible book. Oh, I mean, yeah. compared to someone like I've read a bit of Marcus Aurelius, yes, uh, the Meditations, and you know the language there is a little bit more difficult. But this was a very accessible book. Even looking at different reviews, um, a lot of YouTubers have talked about this book, and they say the same thing. Like, it's, so we're not the first to do it. Not the first, no, uh, but and hopefully not the last. But uh, they talk about the same thing. It's a it's a book that uh, could speak to kind of any generation. I think it could even speak to like high school students, right? I think I think like, it can speak to anyone. To be honest, like he's writing it as like an older man, right? But I think it can speak to anyone for sure. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, obviously the title. It's interesting because. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the slow movement, and yes. now we're talking about how quick life can appear if we don't live it to the fullest. And a quote that stuck out right on the first page of the book, uh, when he's talking to his friend, um, he says, it is not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. Life is long enough. And a sufficiently generous amount has been given to us for the highest achievements as if it were all well invested. So um, right off the bat, he's talking about not necessarily that life is short, like life is uh, literally short, because obviously, hopefully, if you live until your uh, 60s and over, like I think a lot of people in the 21st century living in a healthy country will live too unless uh, some sort of accident happens. It will seem like a long time when you think it through. But I think by living, he has another understanding of that word in mind. It doesn't necessarily just mean the idea of just existing as a person, but I think living for him means something deeper. Yeah, when you use the best use of, make the best use of your time, then life doesn't need to be short, you know. But if, let's say, you don't act on stuff you want to do, you constantly postpone living, uh, then all of a sudden, yes, life seems short because before you got to do 
kind of what you wanted to do in life, it's already passed you by, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, yes, he's making the argument that if we actually use our time wisely, and he gives us kind of his own advice of what's the good life in this book, then it doesn't have to seem short at all. Yeah. He talks about how we complain about nature so much. We complain about how time is shrinking. Um, but he says life is long as long as we know how to use it. And he, he also talks about the importance of pursuing some sort of fixed goal or goals instead of kind of being tossed about um, shifting here and there, not really pursuing anything that's meaningful, but just kind of living uh to the day-to-day -day with no sort of structure or um like i said set goal in mind so exactly it, it needs to be a reflected life rather than like the unreflected life mm -hmm. and i think i was talking to you before we started this how this uh book is so much interconnected with other things we've done on the podcast yes. and i hope we get that a lot those yeah crossovers. and more recently we did la uh, last episode, an episode on minimalism, which uh, we did hear some great feedback from. And um, at the beginning of the book, again, he talks about how people are just so frugal over protecting personal items, right? What, which do, you, we, what do you mean by that? Because he says frugal is a good thing. So explain uh, in more detail. He says how we are, like we're, we're trying to, guard things like we don't want to give anything up yes and how um you know it's kind of we're we're like we talked about um last episode there are things and items that we feel we can't part with or can't give to other people i was talking about my obsession with yes. books books and that was like we got a huge update right we didn't cover your update yes that oh is oh my yes. god yes. i did get rid of three boxes of books which if you guys remember from last episode he literally said like I can't picture myself getting rid of yes. my books. Yeah, I, I, um, it's interesting because after that episode, I went through my entire room, got rid of probably two bags of clothes, went through my closet, got rid of some blankets that I hadn't um, used in a long, long time. And then I'm like, well, the last purging is my bookshelf. So then I carefully went through each book. And really, there were about three boxes, which... I really convinced myself like I haven't looked at these books in two years and I really can't picture myself looking at these books in the next five, at least five years, if and not more. after five years, chances are you're going to be a different person. You're exactly. going to want to read a whole bunch of other stuff. Yeah. So I decided to pack them away, which was tough because some of them were books I used in my master. So some of them had a history to um, things well, I did in the they past. They all have a bit of a history. Yeah. They do. Yeah. I do have some books which were kind of just given to me. Or I just kind of picked up because I thought I would read them. But these I actually used in the past. They had my markings in them. And yeah. I'm like, I will not. Do you, did you use donate this. them? Um, or did I you am. Throw them out? There are some people. No, I didn't throw them out. No, there are. Um, there is a professor I worked with who I'm giving him some of the books. And the rest I will be there in my trunk right now. I will be donating them to a local bookstore. Mm -hmm. uh, which is cool because I went to this bookstore during undergrad Do you want to, to get shout books it out? there. Pardon? Do you want to shout it out? The bookstore? Oh, the bookstore. It's called The Right Bookshop. Okay. Yeah. In St. Catharines. Yeah. In right. St. Catharines. Yeah. It's a, a very affordable bookstore. It has great books of any genre. So, um, And I got a lot of books there in undergrad. And they, they're very generous to students. So um, anyways, they'll be going there. So um, I'm excited about that. But anyway, sorry, going back to... What I was talking about in terms of the items, uh, what Seneca says is how we, just like how I was, you know, feel like we can't part with some of our material possessions. We can't give it away. We mm -hmm. have to keep it. We have to hoard it. But when it comes to time, you know, we're we're willing to just let it pass or not think of it as something precious, like precious materials. We're just able to freely let it go, which he says is an interesting contradiction of uh, humanity. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I've heard that a lot from people, even today, a lot of motivational speakers talk about that. And there's this idea that, you know, time is not worth anything. While really, it's like the one thing you can't get back. 
And when you don't actually use that, it's over. Every day, you're not going to get that day back. Mm -hmm. While money, you can accumulate more, right? Let's say your business takes off, you can make more and more money. But time, it's very hard to uh, add time to your life, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what's that famous song? Everybody's working for the weekend. <laughs> Just is that real. a song? Yeah. It is, yes. Everybody's working for the weekend. Just the idea of, you know, we're yeah, putting how... it, we're wasting our time so then we could get a small amount of time on the weekend for leisure worst trade ever you're trading five days of your for week. two and yeah you exactly. probably don't even get the for whole two. two days and to and a lot of the time people are like by sunday already oh tomorrow i gotta work so they're already thinking about it right yeah so if you don't like your job like you're pretty much kind of just going five days a week so you can get two days off and during that weekend, you're probably worried about starting again on like Monday. Yeah, for sure. Which is uh, related to another thing he talks about, which I hear all the time by people my, well, not, not necessarily people my age maybe, but people definitely in their 40s, 50s. Who yeah, are, that's not your age. Who <laughs> are, yeah, who are kind of nearing uh, in the next maybe 10, 15, 20 years retirement who talk about how like i just can't wait till i retire so i could live my life mm -hmm. and he talks about how um what uh there's a quote where he says when i am 50 i shall this is something he notices a lot of people saying when i am 50 i shall retire into leisure when i am 60 i shall give up my public duties and but then he says but what guarantee do you have of a longer life right that's the first thing you don't know if you'll even make it that long but secondly you're postponing possibly things that are meaningful for you to pursue until you feel that you've put in the time um, yes exactly until you have this sense of security which could never come and even in the book come, yeah. he says that old age is pretty much often an art associated with like illness mm -hmm. and he says it's true that you often have less energy are more sick when you get older so putting off living until then is like a huge mistake right he says even you shouldn't wait to make room for philosophy until you have enough money or whatever you should make room for philosophy now and philosophy is like these ideas studying let's say great people like seneca like Marcus Aurelius, like other philosophers, and that that should be kind of what your life is about. And then whatever is left over should be for making money or or for whatever. And you realize that you don't need that much money. Again, the idea of minimalism pops up in Seneca, not the, obviously the word, but the idea that you don't need that much to live life, to be happy. He talks about you need to clothe yourself from the cold. You need to eat. You need to drink. But otherwise, you doesn't take a lot of work to get the basic necessities. So if you wanted to, you could focus on more important things. And part of being, being frugal is that you're not wasting all your money on these luxuries that don't matter, but you're just spending as little as possible to kind of live your life as well as you can while doing the stuff you want to do like studying philosophy mm -hmm. and that's the thing I, i've started to really love about uh stoicism is that when they're talking about philosophy just stoic philosophy in general like it's a philosophy that is meant to be lived right yes so often we applied yeah we have studied philosophy whether it be in undergrad or graduate school which is so convoluted and and jargon filled and you know you, you think, can't see yourself applying it to no your everyday you, you don't even know how to apply to it yes how to apply it right and with these stoic philosophers like i don't know about seneca but i know marcus aurelius he was writing his letters to himself not really knowing if they were going to get published or not even for the intent of them mm -hmm. to get published he was writing them for him to learn about how to live Right. He was almost teaching himself and just writing out his ideas. And I think that's really interesting how like these these are things that are meant to be lived. Right. We could take this and try to live at least parts of it out. They're not perfect. Mm -hmm. But and um, I think that's something that really has drawn me to stoic philosophy, which I never really 
in undergrad, I never really um, thought of it that way, but I'm very much drawn to this more pragmatist philosophy more than ever, I think, yeah, because and- I'm at a stage in my life where I want what I'm reading to have value in my life. Exactly. And I agree 100%. I always felt that way. And I always, even in university, had to write papers that in some way related to the real world. Like I couldn't get totally abstract to the mm-hmm. point where... Oh, I could. Yeah, I couldn't because I'm like, I can't get motivated if this has no impact on the real world. I'm like, I just feel like I'm wasting my time. Earth so the third planet from the sun. And the only <laughs> That's weird. Alexa responded. I don't, I don't know why, but good job, Alexa. Hopefully she doesn't say anything else. At least I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's true. And what you were saying, here's, here's the response, because you said Marcus Aurelius was writing for himself. So Seneca says this in his book. So if you must fill your time, write something in a simple style for your own use and not for publication. Less is needed if you study only for the day. And so, yeah, he's saying also write for yourself, right? Don't write for fame. Don't write to last for the ages. Ironically, Seneca did, right? We're Mm -hmm. still reading his stuff. But yeah, he's saying write for yourself. And he was often writing letters to close ones, right? His friends or his mother. And the point is, yeah, you don't need to try to write something that will last for all time. That's kind of vain. You never know if that will happen. You'll be dead anyways. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's saying you should focus on stuff that will help you for the days you're living and will help the people around you. And I think that's very good advice. Yeah. And he does have this emphasis on not not focusing so much on the future, such as future worrying about future publications or things like that, but um, focusing on the present. Right. He says um, the greatest obstacle to living um is uh expect expectancy which hangs upon tomorrow and loses today um he goes on to say what are you looking at to what goal are you straining the whole future lies in uncertainty live immediately so his book is about doing things in the now right not caring about what their impact are necessarily or doing things that will have future necessarily future benefits but ensuring that you are taking immediate action now which uh is very much relevant to even like our last book talk uh, with stephen pressfield where he cares more about the acting now living in the present instead of worrying about what the future will hold and i really like that uh focus on the present rather than focusing on what you have to change that may never come yes Yeah. And he even says that often people are either worried about the past or in fear of the future and never actually enjoy the present. So Mm -hmm. he's talking about you need to actually realize that, you know, use stoic philosophy, prepare for what could happen, be prepared for anything. He says anything that ever happened to one man can happen to you and you should be prepared for that. So be prepared for death, be prepared for all that. And once you are, he says, no, a wise man can't be taken by surprise because he's prepared for everything and he's okay with everything. And obviously it's easier said than done to like practice that. Mm -hmm. But I think a useful way that he says to look at it is look at if your possessions, everything, your body, your life, your friends um, are all on loan to you and can be demanded back for payment anytime so view it as a blessing that you even got to borrow this for as long as possible and then when the universe when fortune when god wants it back then you don't resist but you're thankful for the time you actually had with your body with your life and then you give it back being grateful for that opportunity rather than kicking and screaming on your way out kind of thing yeah for sure um yeah, I just think there's there's so much related to, um, like I said, what we talked about. And um, when we talk about that idea of being prepared, something that I know appeals to you, which we kind of alluded to last week, yes. was the idea of practicing poverty, almost this idea yes. of preparing yourself, um, preparing yourself to to go through really something that, you know, 
one of the worst things to go through and not have much or at least seemingly what one of the most yeah things. exactly he wouldn't say and he even said in the book that poverty is often spoken of in positive terms by great philosophers mm-hmm. because you have less to lose you have more time to focus on studying and mm-hmm. stuff like that um but yeah i mean continue yeah but um what i was going to say is yeah it's, it's just it's it's fascinating this idea of uh, practicing poverty. Yeah, definitely. You look at a lot of philosophers, thinkers, right? You look at like if when you're reading, if you ever read the New Testament, right? You look at Jesus. He's someone who he was considered like a champion of the poor. He uh, very much overtly said to his followers that you have to drop your things and come and follow me. So to have like a clear, straight path in life, you have to be willing to drop those material things that are weighing you down right so i think definitely that idea of um of seneca speaks about it in his writings and other writings the idea of spending time going through a period of um you know resisting kind of indulgent um desires right i think is is really important and uh, it, it gets you to practice something that who knows may happen in the future. Um, I think that's, that's fascinating. Yes. I don't know if you want to explain Yeah, and you'll be it. prepared for it, right? Because he talks about, he compares it to an army. And before they didn't use to fight during the winter, right? Because they didn't have the technology and it would have been uh, difficult to fight in the winter. So they fought in the summer. And in the winter, they used the time to prepare for fighting in the summer. And mm-hmm. he said... If you prepare for war in the winter, you'll be prepared in the summer. If you don't prepare when you have the chance, then you won't be ready when the war actually comes. So he compares poverty, practicing poverty to a similar situation. You That could very well happen to anyone, right? Come into a state of poverty. And if you practice it before you need to, then you're going to be much more prepared, just like the people fighting the war who put in the time to actually practice it. Yeah, it's almost thinking of at times, what are kind of like the bare necessities I need? And again, going back to minimalism, because it's not just about, um, you know, it, it can be applied in so many ways. It could be consumption, right? Those times where we feel we, we desire something or need something, whether it be a book or a material object, and we just quickly um, snap at it and just can, it buy it without thinking, right? Mm-hmm. Or even uh, what he talks about in the book is he also brings up the idea of eating and how we shouldn't, you know, the stomach is only so big and we shouldn't be consuming things just for the sake of consuming things. And obviously by consuming, I mean, you know, eating, drinking. We shouldn't be doing these things just for the sake of doing them, just for like, you know, uh, cust- you know, customs where we're just eating ourselves um, till our belts explode, right? We exactly. should, we like should all understand. Places, yes, we sh- And it, it's amazing because after reading Seneca and some of the other works we've looked at, I have not had the slight inkling to go to a buffet. Buffets used to be like my favorite spots. I'd, I'd think, oh, yes. like if I were to go out, well, why wouldn't you go to a buffet? Yeah. You get so many money. selections. <laughs> and not only that, but like you just get to eat and no one tells you when to stop. Not that it doesn't happen anywhere else. But if you went to a restaurant and ordered two main courses, they'd look at you like you have two heads. It's just like it's socially acceptable to like mm-hmm. continue to eat. Yes. No, that's very fascinating. And that's a great example for other things like wealth, for example, because no, nobody, for example, I think he might have been in this book or it might have been the minimalism book where they said, uh, I think it was in the minimalism book where he said that even Steve Jobs can only eat a certain amount of meals a day or whatever. So, you know, no matter how rich you are, it's not like you can eat or you should eat more food than someone else. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it can be a bad thing if oh you overeat it's actually healthier to eat less so just as the same way it can be a vice to overspend and it can actually have negative effects on you if you get too used to uh luxury and you forget how to deal with uh, more difficult situations here's a quote from the book that that i like because it shows you how if you're going through hard times or if you have consider hard times in general 
Then he talks about a good frame to view it in. So he's talking about hard times making us stronger and able to endure more in the future, while good times make us soft, so to speak, or unprepared for difficult situations. So he says, weakened by long prosperity, let them collapse at the threat of the most trivial injuries. But let those who have spent all their years suffering disasters endure the worst afflictions with a brave and resolute staunchness. Everlasting misfortune does have one blessing, that it ends up by toughening those whom it constantly afflicts. So I think that's a great way, and I think a lot of this, what Seneca can offer us is ways to reframe things that happen to us in life. And when we're going through a challenge, it might be easy to think, oh, this is difficult, I don't want to be going through this. But if you view it as something, as a chance to become stronger, as a chance to toughen up, as a chance to be ready for more difficult situations in the future, while others who haven't had to struggle as much uh, are not as prepared and will crumble when they face similar situations. I think that's a great way to uh, view a difficult situation you're going through and help you through it. Because once it becomes, you reframe it as a positive thing in your head, then it can actually go much smoother than if you're constantly resisting it and wishing it wasn't happening to you. Yeah, and that, uh... I think seminal idea from Seneca has been um, written about from, I know we've talked about um, yourself and I don't know if we've mentioned him on the podcast, but Ryan Holiday, who is um, a contemporary uh, entrepreneur, um, writer, writer who is very much interested in Stoic philosophy and how it... Um, how it influences the way that we live and the way that we function in the world. Uh, he wrote a book called The Obstacle is the Way, which is all about that idea how um, whenever we're faced with hardship, whether it be you know some sort of more overt or physical obstacle or even some other obstacle, psychological, emotional, job loss, right? The idea of just staying put and feeling that, oh, well, that's it. My life is over is a very um, short-sighted way of dealing with things. And he goes back to the Stoics, specifically Seneca, and his ideas to show how these philosophers thought of obstacles as not just barriers, but built, um, opportunities and, exactly. and building blocks to grow stronger. And there's just a story that Seneca talks about, the founder of Stoicism, a Zeno, and how when he was moving over a ship of his with all his possessions was destroyed and he said well looks like fortune wanted to be wanted me to be a less encumbered philosopher mm -hmm. so he just took it as a way to frame it into like a positive thing oh i'm just going to be less reliant on material goods or possessions as a philosopher rather than being so sad about how he just lost all of his nice things that he purchased before yeah, which if you look at some of our, I'm not saying we have um, easy problems, but sometimes we grapple over the smallest things, right? Our phone won't send a message yes. um, in time. How much times you will have like one of those many heart attacks when you're like, where's my phone? Where's yes, my phone? <laughs> exactly, right? And, um, you know, we don't realize that, number one, there are a lot more difficult things that we could be um encountering but number two even if it's something small like losing your phone or something else like that right it can open up an opportunity for you to learn more about yourself and grow right maybe if you didn't lose your phone you wouldn't have run into someone and had a great conversation mm -hmm. and that could spark something that you don't know could could uh flourish into something really positive so um, yeah, I think that's the interesting thing about uh, Seneca is that he does this thing where he kind of like flips obstacles upside down, right? And makes them something which uh, promotes growth, which um, I think is, is, is really interesting, right? When, um, and, and very relatable to, like I said, um, a lot of our other topics, right? You go back to Stephen Pressfield when he talks about the importance of... Um, acting right and being a professional well the thing is how do you become a professional most likely it's because of an obstacle right it's not just you're born this 
person who is who is pursuing these things and never has any roadblocks exactly. it's because of that roadblocks that those roadblocks that you're able to become some sort of professional and push through and resist um those temptations and it's self-imposed difficulty right like the Seneca talks about not giving into resistance being a professional showing up every day even when you're sick it's like this self-imposed uh, adversity that you conquer in order to become a professional and hopefully get the success uh, that comes along with being a published writer or whatever mm -hmm. so yeah and it's that idea and we do that too right we wake up early we go for a run we uh, we try to push ourselves in situations where we don't necessarily need to like we could both sleep in more but that by putting ourselves to those difficult situations we're trying to toughen ourselves up you know and that's part of the stoic belief too and here's another quote i like from seneca prosperity does not elevate the sage and adversity does not depress him rely as much as possible on uh, the sage relies as much as possible on himself and derives pleasure and delight from himself. So in the situation where you're deriving your pleasure and delight from yourself rather than materialistic things around you or letting someone else or like blaming the government for your emotions uh, or not living the life you want, Seneca is very much about taking responsibility uh, and putting the focus on yourself to make yourself happy. And I think that's really important. Seneca warns against even being friends with people who complain too much. He calls them, yeah, the gloomy people. Yes, the gloomy people who are constantly finding things to complain about. Because, and this is an idea that's in self-development, kind of the five people you spend the most time with, you become the average of them. And it's very important, right, who your friends are. Because you'll naturally start to think more like your friends they'll try to start to think more like you and if you're constantly around gloomy people who focus on the negative it'll just become normal for you to do that as well and he says that's the number one thing to avoid people who are negative and focus on those uh the bad things and complaining rather than realizing that they have the power to change their own lives if they wanted to and the power to accept their circumstances and do what's within their power to make them better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think something else he talks about is um, the importance of not overworking yourself, right? And uh, the idea of not, um, you know, putting, you know, going to work. I think he's more talking about labor for the sake of labor, um, um, being able to come with an income but the idea of some people kind of overwork themselves just for the sake of an income and a better future and how really if you're in a situation where you're in a job where you're putting in way too many hours hours that are unnecessary just for the sake of having more money right this big pile of that wealth. you'll use to buy things to make you feel yes. better because you feel sad most likely if that happens you're probably with a group of other people who are in the same boat as you you probably all have a, a negative mindset about things like oh i just wish i didn't have to go through this to pay for x pay for the new pool pay for whatever right and um you know you don't realize how negativity is not necessarily just friends, but people at, you know, your workplace, if mm -hmm. there is this negative vibe or going on at your workplace, right? It can, that negativity can, can be a result from there and can have, um, you know, crazy effects. So he does, he does talk about that as well. The importance of not overworking yourself just for the sake of, um, having a certain amount of money and he talks about the ideal amount of money which i think is interesting mm -hmm. is yeah, I like that, that which neither falls within the range of poverty so you know not something where he talks about obviously about practicing practicing poverty but it's not ideal to not have enough that you can't support yourself uh nor is it far exceeds poverty right so you don't mm -hmm. need you know this amount that really what are you going to do with it all you know you, you want to have to strike that balance, which a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, whether it be the slow movement or minimalism, is all about striking a balance. And that's what Seneca's aim is as well. It's striking a balance of wealth, right? Having enough that can support yourself and 
some of the essential things and maybe here and there being able to get things that um, you like, right? That you don't necessarily need, but you like, but not having so much that, you know, not working so much that the uh, you're doing it strictly for the wealth in order for it to just accumulate and accumulate just for the sake of saying that you have it because that's not really needed in life, right? We don't mm-hmm. really need that. Yeah, for sure. And that will tend to be a much happier life, one that's not uh, revolving around materialistic things, but one that's revolving around, let's say, your own self-education, figuring out what you want in life, what's important to you, uh, spending time with the people you care about, right? That's more important and that's more linked to happiness than just the materialistic stuff. And uh, Seneca is someone who actually went through a situation where he did have a lot of money and then he was exiled and he says and even to the exile which a lot of people would look at as shameful and a lot of people would have at the time said oh that's a horrible thing that happens he questions whether it's really horrible and he says to a wise man every place is his country and he looks at the positives like uh, more time he has more time for reading and studying and things aren't as bad as people really make them out to be. So that I found very useful, like that idea that whatever happens, you can reframe it in your head. It's true, exile, he was even talking about how the money uh, that he that a lot of people get when they were exiled in that time was more than previously like the strongest people or the richest people had like they had less less luxuries than these people during Seneca's time and today it's the same thing like if you look at the king of France in the 1400s they had he had way less than we do in terms of modern luxuries like all of the technology we have uh the everything we have in the bathroom like the toilets the the warm water whatever we want the tv that provides countless uh infinity pretty much hours of movies that we want we can watch whenever right we don't have to go to gladiator stadiums we can just watch like these crazy movies and we can do all of this stuff for way less money even though like kings of previous times had no way of doing this so it puts into perspective how lucky we are and how much we have and how many luxuries we get to use even though even if we're not the richest people, for example. Yeah, for sure. I find that interesting how you bring up um, his exile because, again, going back to Ryan Holiday's book, uh, The Obstacle is the Way, he talks about... Um, basically, I mean, I, I highly recommend the book. It's it's using... Uh, Which one exactly? I'm, I'm specifically talking about Obstacle is okay. the Way. Uh, he's... he's um, basically using this this framework that Seneca talks about and uh, his book is kind of an illustration of various figures throughout history um, applying whether they consciously knew it or not kind of uh, Seneca's way of viewing you know obstacles and, and hardships and um, he, he brings up this story of Hurricane Carter who I believe was a uh, professional boxer who was um, also, I guess, a professional boxing coach later on. And he was wrongly accused of, I don't know how this even happens, quadruple homicide. And um, he had a 20-year prison sentence. And rather than complaining and say, and you know living this kind of you know pouting life in prison and, and always saying, woe is me, he thought of it as an opportunity for him to be able to work on his writing. Yes. And so he spent that time. He thought, well, this will be a time in my life where I'll have isolation, right? I won't have any obligations, really. Distractions. And so, you know, might as well use it as a time to improve myself. And um, at the end, he felt he was better that better than he was before entering prison um, in many aspects of his life. And how, uh, you know, that obstacle really made him a better person. And so, yeah, for sure, Seneca's um, exile. I mean, when we think of exile, it's always with a negative connotation, right? Mm-hmm. It's because uh, something is wrong with that person and um, quote unquote wrong with that person. And, and we associate with punishment, right? Yes. But really, it could have its own blessing. Yes. Which, I, again, yeah. refraining 
punishment is interesting as well, which we're taught as kids that getting punished is a bad thing. Well, you know, there are some other opportun- other um, opportunities that could arise from being punished. Yes, and like I believe I told you, um, I believe Malcolm X was also in a situation where he was sent to prison. I read his autobiography a while ago. And he also used it as a time to read, as a time to educate himself and be a better person when he came out, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of people would associate prison as like, oh man, like that's punishment, that's gonna suck, that's gonna be terrible. But you can find situations even in, in that scenario to kind of better yourself and improve your life. Mm-hmm. And we have a even a quote here that also talks about the importance of like the way you view things. Uh, Seneca says, how then can you think it is the amount of money that matters and not the attitude of mind? Someone dreaded having 10 million and what others pray for, he escaped by poison. So he was talking about a situation where someone had a certain amount of money coming to them and a lot of people would pray for that amount of money because it's way more than was necessary to live off of. And that person was so used to living in, with more money that they ended up taking poison to kind of kill themselves because more money than most people have was still not enough for them because of the kind of contrast bias, I guess, because they were used to getting so much more. So that's a great example of how it's not important necessarily how much money you have as much as how you view it and what you're spending money on. And there's all these situations, even among celebrities where often they have they money is not an issue and even in better developed countries where money isn't an issue yet there are higher suicide rates so you have people who have achieved money maybe don't even have to work for money for the rest of their life and yet decide to resort to suicide or something like that so or drugs so clearly um seneca is right when he says it's not money that'll solve our problems we have to look within it's not the outside we have to solve our own problems within and philosophy he suggests is a great way to do that Mm -hmm. um i'm curious what uh because i know you said this seneca's writings has you know influenced you um so far yeah and i'm curious like what has his writings has it made you rethink things as a YouTuber? Has it reaffirmed things as a YouTuber? Yes. So that's a good question. Um, and I want to just say quickly that, yeah, I, th- I feel like uh, the best thing about this podcast and a lot of these books and ideas we're discussing is that they are week to week all actually impacting my life. Mm-hmm. You know, even like you actually threw out like or donated three like a uh, box of books. You know, in university, you're unlikely to make those changes, right, when you're studying. But here, every week, we're almost like implementing stuff we're reading about. So that in and of itself is really cool. And for an example of impacting my life as a YouTuber, well, see, I'm I'm focusing less, I believe, on the money, um, which, you know, you do need to a certain extent to live, but I'm trying to put less focus on the money and more focus on just uh, the process and enjoying the process and doing the work for the fans that are watching, right? And being less concerned about money because money, if you look at it, is a way you can keep on doing what you love. And I can, if I have more money, I can for longer produce videos for the fans watching, Um, but it can become to the point where you're worried too much about it. And you're like, oh, man, I need to make money because I don't know if I'll keep making it. But at the end of the day, we don't need a lot of money, you know, to to be happy, to take care of our basic needs. So to me, Seneca would teach me and everybody who who has any kind of job to worry less about money and fearing poverty less and being more focused on just the labor and and enjoying that as well as the idea of implementing more philosophy. Like I'm just coming out with a new video about the philosophy of a certain uh, character in an anime. And that was probably influenced also by 
by Seneca who constantly promotes philosophy. And I like looking at philosophy in anime. We did, uh, me and my brother recently did an anime and philosophy panel where we talked in front of like a full crowd of people about anime and philosophy at Anime North. So that was awesome. And I like, I like looking at works of art through a lens of philosophy. Well, that's, I've never, could you expand briefly on maybe something that you talked about on the panel? That's interesting. I didn't know you were. Um, yeah, well, we, we talked about different things. Um, we often bring up Guren Lagan, an anime where you have a clear nod towards Plato's allegory of the cave, where the characters start off underground, right? And people don't believe that there's a surface at all. And then like Plato's, in Plato's cave, people are actually tied in a cave looking at shadows and they think it's reality until someone escapes and they see that there's a real world outside mm -hmm. and that the shadows are not the real world. And then he he's the, becomes the philosopher king and he needs to go back and try to show people that there's a world outside of the shadows, but they're so used to the shadows being their reality that they think the philosopher king is crazy. Well, in the same way, these guys are stuck in a cave and then everyone thinks there's nothing above the cave except one character and he ends up breaking through the cave and there is a surface and it's about kind of doing the impossible, questioning tradition, not just following what people tell you to do, right? Uh, the idea of it being better to be outside of the matrix than to live a fake life within the matrix, like in a dream kind of thing. Don't be satisfied for a dream or a fantasy. Go for the truth. And that kind of message really resonates with me, right? Because we're constantly also trying to identify what's shadows, what's reality, what's all this stuff that we're learning, what part of our culture are the shadows. So like, let's say you needing a Gucci shirt that costs $200 is a shadow you don't actually need it but if you're around friends who are constantly wearing gucci and it's normal for you to spend 200 dollars on a t-shirt you'll think that's normal for reality while really you can buy like a 20 dollars shirt and be fine so that's the kind of stuff that we were talking about and in the most recent video i'm focusing a lot on perspective and how characters view life some view it as suffering and death as like a release from that suffering while some view life as worth living, even if it's difficult and there's struggle within it. So, and then those characters fight because they're all trying to shape the world according to their own philosophy. So it, it's always present. It's just whether you want to sit down and actually look for the philosophy or whether you want to kind of just watch for the battle scenes. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's funny how, you know, I don't know how you feel about, um, anime's perception in mainstream culture but would you feel I remember when we had your brother on the podcast uh, people think of anime as like cartoonish kid stuff like there's just mm -hmm. you know would you would you say similarly you know people are is that a mainstream kind of um, view would you f say of anime because like you, you we talk about that stuff and how I'd like a probably... lot of the conversations we've talked about in Seneca um, are relevant within some of these animes or mm -hmm. maybe a lot. I'm not well versed, mm -hmm. you know, is, is it not getting its due recognition as a, you know, well, a very, you know, it can be a serious form of art depending I'm on biased, the show. Obviously, but of course I have to say, yes, it's a serious form of art and yes, it's totally, um, it is usually by older generations, not understood, right? Cause you say, cartoon has certain connotations and mm -hmm. in serbian like you know you kind of have to say cartoon because there's no word for anime kind of thing um so with older generations they understand it less younger generations tend to be the younger generations as they're coming up tend to be more open-minded i think anime is becoming more mainstream but yeah you have shows where let's say uh ryan let me give you an example a philosophical example you have a show where called Death Note, where a character gets a book that if they write someone's name in it, that person dies. So what does he start doing? He starts writing down the names of the major criminals in the world so that they'll be gone from the world and that the crime rate will go down because people are noticing that 
major that criminals are being punished and he believes himself to be some kind of god and yet there's this other person named l who's trying to catch him and he's focused and his form of justice is not the ends justify the means just kill the negative people the bad people so that there's less crime his is no that's not fair that person who's killing those people is being a murderer you have to give them justice you have to bring them to kind of trial you have to do things the right way the way you actually carry about getting to your end destination is important and you can't just do whatever it takes to get to your end goal so in that clashing of philosophies who's right Mm -hmm. you know so you gotta it's not black and white answers and the anime anime often have situations where you can kind of empathize with different perspectives and it's never like oh this person is clearly right this person is clearly wrong right it's always uh, a shade of gray, I guess. It's yeah. difficult to realize, and and it, and it exercises your brain because you're like, "Huh, I never thought of that." Yeah, what is right? What is justice? And you have to figure that out for yourself. Yeah, for sure. It's a story like any other story, like picking up any other book, right? Right. You look at like Nabok- uh, Nabokov, a very controversial writer, right? And like a book like one of the most controversial books ever, right? Like Lolita. Mm-hmm. Uh, such a controversial book but I mean the beauty of that book is just that gray area presents to you right Um, so like how do you empathize with this person when they're x right there they have these characteristics so you know anime does definitely have at least I'm learning from you it has definitely a lot of these philosophical um, yes right um, moments where right it leaves things up in the air and that's why i like it like attack on titan is one of my favorite anime and it's all about constantly shifting your worldview of that anime so first you think one person is the enemy then you figure out that another person is the enemy then you figure out they're not even an enemy because they're doing what's just and good from their perspective and that constantly happens from everyone's perspective is actually uh fleshed out and so you can see where everyone's coming from Unlike, let's say, cartoons we watched as kids when there's like an evil villain who just wants to destroy the world for Mm -hmm. no reason, you know, like that's clearly that's more for just like entertainment and Mm -hmm. not thinking about it too much. But here the villains are more often than not have very uh, fleshed out philosophies that you can begin to understand if you actually listen to their Mm -hmm. backgrounds and listen to where they're coming from. Yeah, the cartoons as a kid are... Are more, I think, just moralizing things, right? This or is or comedy or stuff. Yes, like that, yeah. and whereas these kind of leave it up to the watcher, or the reader exactly. to make the decision. Which, I mean, going back to Seneca, I don't think um, we talked about like Stoicism isn't perfect. I don't think Seneca is presenting, you know, the perfect doctrine, or he really wants it to be doctrine. He's just trying to sort things out himself and. What better way um, to sort things out than um, go for walks? And he's a huge proponent of walking. Just like, it's fascinating. I I I, see that come up a lot. Yeah, Yeah. I went, uh, I have a book at home, which I didn't get rid of, um, called The Philosophy of Walking. And it's, uh, I, I don't know if Seneca is included, but there are definitely a number of prominent philosophers, such as uh, Nietzsche, uh, Thoreau, who uh, talk about the importance of walking and how it helps inform one's own philosophy. And Seneca himself says, we must go for walks outdoors so that the mind can be strengthened and invigorated by a clear sky and plenty of fresh air. Um, at, ti- at times it'll acquire fresh energy from a journey by a carriage and a change of scene or from socializing and drinking freely. He also talks at other times about the importance of um, giving yourself mental breaks, which is yes, relevant which is to a walk would be. Kind yes, of, yeah. relevant to uh, what we talked about in you know the slow movement, right? The importance mm-hmm. of knowing when to step away from things, and I, I just I love the idea. I know you and I, we when we are exercising, we're 
we're doing more fast paced um exercising like jogging running mm-hmm. but i do love you know from time to time i don't do it as often as i used to going for walks because walks i think are deeply whether we think of it as it or, or not are deeply philosophical in the sense that there are these kind of journeys we go on and many times when we go for walks we don't really know where we're going we're just going for it for the sake of going for it whether it be to clear our mind well that's impressive because i usually know my route before i go. do you yeah. see i i whenever i go for a walk i just and i know many other people like this i go for the sake of going wherever it brings me it brings me and that's if i'm back home i need to go on a walk with you man <laughs> yeah if i come back home in 20 minutes i that's what it was meant to be what if, if we end home, up on like a boat or something <laughs> well hopefully not well no. maybe that's a good thing well yeah but like, um yeah, no I, I like that idea of you know the idea of walking kind of represents thinking you don't know where your your thinking is going to go your thought process the creative process it may take longer sometimes than others and um you know some of the best writer uh some of the best um writers were great walkers as well yeah right? musicians philosophers right or runners like murakami is mm-hmm. is a big runner and he does marathons like pretty much every year but yeah i mean that's that's true and he gives other uh tips that some people use like naps he talked about naps he talked about how so often people do their hardest work which we talked about in the morning hours and then in the afternoon they reserve for like less difficult things um, and he talked about how some people every month take a time off where they go somewhere else while other people kind of put those breaks within their day. So yeah, even, even all the, those years ago, uh, it's like almost a different, different world, how long ago that was yet. He's still saying stuff that completely applies to us today, right? Mm-hmm. Stuff that go for walks to commune with nature. We, we do that. We mm-hmm. have that. We need that. Um, take breaks right to because you can't always be at he talked about kind of your brain can't always be at the same frequency you got to let it rest you can't just be constantly going Mm -hmm. uh that still applies right we're still human beings so i think what what fascinated me about reading seneca and i read his unsureness of life and his letters from a stoic is that how much his life is similar to our lives right now like he was saying in the the letters from a stoic that he was talking about how everyone showers at that point every day and how there used to be a time where people showered like once a week and that was enough and it's funny because today like i thought back then they'd be showering like once a week but no even in seneca's time they were showering like every day Mm -hmm. so they had a lot of the luxuries that we have today and that surprised me yeah no it's it's Interesting, even, I mean, what we're talking about in terms of kind of self-care is very evident in this whole mental health movement we're going through now, right? I mean, it, the idea of of taking care of yourself and going through breaks, right? We think it's something that is new and revolutionary, but it has deep roots. And we see those roots in Seneca as well, right? He knew the importance of the brain is like a muscle, right? And it needs, it it can be stretched, but it also needs time for healing. And um, for sure, I mean, like Seneca is someone who I think is, you know, well, I don't know if if he's well beyond his time, but he knows his time, right? And I think a lot of times- He knows the human condition. Yeah, I think a lot of times we underestimate the past and think, you know, these things weren't talked about then. I think- they were maybe they were repressed in some ways but um i mean i think definitely seneca is talking about these universal truths that are for sure applicable during his time period and for sure today yes definitely and i'd say this is a great like just guide um to life or to just improving your life to read read seneca's work and it definitely applies almost everything i read applies to today because we're humans and we still function very similarly even though we have more gadgets and technologies now than before uh ryan i was wondering what you think about the fact because we me and ryan obviously read a lot of books and we have a lot of books even some that 
are going to be donated. <laughs> but uh, he said, Seneca says, it is far better to devote yourself to a few authors than to get lost among many. And then he says that some people keep books as decorations, but you should just buy enough books for use and none for embellishment. Mm -hmm. I absolutely remember that quote. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I like that idea of, well, in terms of the mention of books as decorations, yes, I agree that, you know, um, going back to last week, right, I, I think still am someone, but definitely was someone who had books around his room just for the sake of saying, I have that book, mm -hmm. right? Not necessarily that I've read that person. So, yeah, I think um, I, I definitely agree with his idea of, you know, keeping um, keeping a stock of texts which are meaningful to you right now or will be not necessarily books for the sake of having them. The other one, the narrowing your scope of reading, I think is interesting. Um, I think on the one hand, I totally, I, I do agree with it. Going back to that idea that we talked about a number of weeks ago with excellent sheep, the idea of the triple major, right? Mm -hmm. Having this like, having your hands in like a million different, uh, right, a million different things and thinking that that's the way to um, to live a meaningful life is just to know so many different things and not to dive deeply into anything. I think definitely that's, you know, that can be problematic. Um, on the other hand, I do admit I'm starting to rethink, sorry, rethink some things. I'm reading this book right now about generalism which I'm trying to look at the title here. It, it just came out not too long ago. Um, something about range. Let me see if I could find it here. Um, no, maybe we could, uh, maybe I could, I could mention it, give it a shout out next week. I'm still working through it, so I don't know how, mm. uh, how my final thoughts will be on it. But um, he basically talks about the importance of um, not necessarily over specializing in something and how there are great benefits in doing more than one thing. And so, um, you know, and the importance of interdisciplinary kind of work, not just in, he's not really talking about in academia, but in many things, sports, other things. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it is interesting to be able to have a web of thinkers that maybe you could draw from, maybe not necessarily you have an expertise in any one of them, but um, you could see these connections. I don't know. I'm kind of divided. Yeah. What do you think? I, I like the way he worded it, right? He said, it is far better to devote yourself to a few authors than to get lost among many. And he's saying those few authors are usually like, let's say, time-tested authors who, you know, not all books are created equal. And now more than ever, we have so many books coming out like every day that you could never read them in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Right. So I like the idea in the sense that I felt before I was often just reading to the next book, right? Next book, yeah. next book. And I think this kind of this focuses more on depth and rereading, right? Which we probably don't do enough. And I know uh, Tim Ferriss said he rereads Seneca, his letters, um, I think once every four months, he said, or something like that. So rereading is underrated and some people, you know, don't read any books in a year. Um, but for us who do read, uh, I think it is, there's something to be said about going more into in depth rather than being too associated with reading as many books as possible and not digesting the idea and making the false assumption that all books are equal because they're not right. Some will provide better ideas that will help you live your life better. And some will be, pure escapism that won't actually impact your life right mm -hmm. so because of that i think he makes a good point and if you're ready to move on you have a good sense of the author yeah move on or move on to something else but the lot getting lost among many i feel like is a good good wording because you don't want to read so much not understand anything not be able to develop your own thinking because you're too busy jumping from book to book yeah, no, I, I I do like the 
idea of, because that was a problem I had before I was, I had this, um, this goal of just, you know, kind of, um, reading through books to be able to say like I check mark them and there yeah. were times I you know and, I skim through too, parts I, I fall in for that too yeah, yeah. and um, no I think the idea of of it is definitely important to go deeply in at least some of the books that you read and um, for sure I, I completely um, agree with that I do think maybe going back maybe I, I if I should kind of re um phrase what I meant maybe the idea of it's okay to read books like we don't have to stick to a certain author or a certain Mm -hmm. small set of authors we can go outside of our comfort zone and read other things I think that's more of the case that this book is trying to make and I actually have the title it actually just came out a little only a but a a short time ago Uh, it's called range why generalists triumph in a specialized world little provocative title there so um it is i'm going through i'll see what i think but um but no i mean i i do think going back to your point that yeah we shouldn't um read for the sake of of skimming things and saying or that okay we've a, conquered on that. a list or something yes like we've we've conquered that book i don't think reading is this checklist that we're going through fast and again it goes back to that slow movement reading for pleasure reading for meaning uh there is another book um out there about slow reading um i'm trying to think of who the author is and uh, that book has always intrigued me for a long time uh, i can't find the author uh, precisely but yeah the idea of the importance of being able to uh, slow down in one's reading to to get into depth is important because we live in this age i even saw i was listening to a podcast the other day they were advertising an app that basically summarizes all like summarizes classical classic books mm. in 15 minutes. Yes. It's like the perfect, they're advertising Example. like yeah. it's the perfect way for you to get what you need from the book in 15 minutes. Cause exactly. you're just it's so all busy like to impress other people. Yes, right? to it's impress not, people it's not parties. actually for yourself. No. Yeah. And, um, I totally agree with, with the idea that there's too much focus on impressing others rather than what works for you. And I've also focused, like, let's say, this year I had the goal to finish 52 books and I'm still going to finish it just because that was one of my goals. But again, those 52 books are not all going to be equal. Like some probably deserve more time than others. Are you just reading through books, skimming them, or are you actually applying the lessons to your life? Right? Cause a book is not going to be of much value, especially self-development books, philosophy books. If you're not actually applying what's said and then just moving on and forgetting what's said. So I think um, there's something to be said about reading more in depth, about taking your time with books, applying them to your life and not just being like kind of reading them for entertainment, moving on, reading them for entertainment. So that's that's definitely something I feel. And and I feel like one of the better things about Seneca's works is also uh, how he approaches the fear of death. And he says kind of that's a fear you need to conquer if you want to accomplish anything like important in life. You need to conquer that fear of death. Mm -hmm. And so he says do not fear death and then he says unless you regard anything that can happen as bound to happen you give adversity a power over you which the man who sees it first can crush so it's saying kind of don't be afraid of death see it as it could happen at any point and and be okay with that be thankful for the time you've had understand that your life is on loan your body is on loan and the only thing that don't change he would argue is like the spirit right but besides that everything else can change and we should be ready and expect it to change Mm -hmm. yeah and we shouldn't be fearing death if we are living in the present moment right because we'd be we're concerned about what's important right now and not anxieties and fears down the road and by the way that book i was i was kind of stumbling over it's called on the pleasures of slow reading by Matthew Linton. Mm-hmm. I've heard a lot of good things about it. Interesting, yeah. So, so we're gonna definitely uh, explore more more of these ideas as we go on. These are, you know, some of my favorite ideas that Seneca brings up. He might very well be my favorite uh, Stoic philosopher, but there's still more for me to even learn about uh, Stoicism. So definitely, I'll get more into that. 
uh, in the future. Ryan, any final thoughts you want to say before we sign off? No, I don't think so. I'm again. I'm I'm in the similar boat to you. I'm reading another book by Ryan Holiday every night called The Daily Stoic. Mm-hmm, yeah, which I, I know you've read it, and um, I didn't follow the rules at all. No, I just um, basically it's an interesting book that um, is kind of like a cal has a ca- uh, a, a calendar and a universal calendar yeah. date where you go to the appropriate date and that has some sort of stoic saying uh, by some sort of stoic philosopher and then this kind of modern interpretation of the quote and how it applies to how it can apply to everyday life so i'm trying to you know get just a little bit you know um just spoon fed a little bit of stoic philosophy through ryan holiday uh, a little bit every day just to Mm -hmm. uh, work my way through it i think i'll definitely my I do want to read more Seneca. I think it would be cool to read uh, more Marcus Aurelius. I know I read some of him is really in good university. Too. Yep, for sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting how a lot of pod, or not a lot, but there are some prominent podcasters out there like Tim Ferriss who um, go to Stoic philosophy and yes. are obsessed with Stoic philosophy. And thank it a lot for like their success and their happiness. Mm-hmm. So clearly it's been around for a long time and it's still helping like very successful people. So there's something in here and uh, we're here to kind of discover it and to use it and to apply it and not just read about it. And just another quick example about how, you know, these books are actually changing our lives with the minimalist book. So before I would have, I would have purchased books quickly before I even like read my last one. And to, I had this week, I had a situation where I was going to buy this one book, which I'm interested. It's like The Courage to Not Be Liked, and it's actually a Japanese author. So I'm very interested in that book. And Ryan, maybe we talk about it in a future podcast episode. But yeah, so I was going to buy that one. And then another one popped up because I was into stoicism. So it's about a stoic. It's a stoic book about stoic philosophy. And I was like, Hmm. And I was considering getting both. And last month or something, I probably would have gotten both and then just waited to read them. But now I was like, I was still reading Seneca's letters. And I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to buy either until I read Seneca's letters. Then I could buy one, but not both. And mm-hmm. then like proceed like that kind of thing. So I'm actually like implementing kind of the minimalism, not going in, like, not purchasing in excess more than I can read. Uh, Seneca's ideas of just, you know, buying what you can actually read and learn from. And I'm also getting more on my Kindle, so I don't have so much physical space taken up. Um, So just that's one small example of how these books, these ideas of minimalism, Seneca, are actually influencing my daily actions and my daily purchases. And I think that that's really cool. Yeah, no, that's good. And for sure, we can't make an excuse that, oh, if we don't get it now, we may have to wait like in today's culture. Yeah, I could get it right now on Kindle. You could, one click, if you decide to a week from now get it, you could get it at your door in probably less than a day. So Exactly. And worst case scenario, Amazon shuts down. I have many books around here that I still haven't read. Yes. Yes. All right. That was awesome. That's our second book club episode. And we don't know yet what's going to be the one for next month or the end of this month, actually. We don't know what book it's going to be, but we'll let you know. We'll think about it and then come back to it. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time.